So I'm gonna start with uh, Ashley Hill Hamilton. If you could come to the front. Ashley is a mother of three, ages one to 19, and a native of Uptown New Orleans. She is the policy manager for the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights and the former advocacy and outreach director of Birthmark Dua Collective. Welcome, Ashley. Next, we have Audrey Stewart, midwife with the New Orleans Midwives. Audrey is in the film. Uh, Audrey Stewart is an advocate, educator, birth worker, and mother. Originally from Mississippi, she has lived in New Orleans for more than a decade. Over the past 15 years, she has advocated for a just hurricane recovery, led a variety of criminal justice, education, ec educational equity, and reproductive justice initiatives, and supported dozens of birthing families as a per uh, perinatal health and breastfeeding advocate, doula, and student of midwifery. Next, I'd like to welcome Shatamia Webb, who is the founder and CEO of Baby Catcher Birth Center in Lafayette. Tammy has been, with, has been a part of the birth community here in Lafayette since 2012. She is a licensed, uh, sorry, she is licensed both in the state of Louisiana and nationally as a certified professional midwife. She is trained at the Birth Center for Lafayette in Louisiana and finished her apprenticeship at, in a home birth practice. Her experience includes over 150 births. Let's give it up. <laughs> and last, I want to introduce our uh, moderator and Patois Collective member, Shana M. Griffin. Shana is a feminist activist, researcher, sociologist, artist, abolitionist, and mother whose work engages history and memory as sites of resistance, rupture, and protest. Her practice is interdisciplinary, research-based, activist-centered and decolonial. Also, shameless plug, if you don't know, Shana has curated an amazing exhibition that is showing at the Ashe Cultural Arts Center uh, next Thursday, March 30th. Um, it's called In the Spirit of Black. So if you have time, go see that. It's a photographic exhibition, um, part of a seeing, the Seeing Black series, and it showcases creative approaches to contemporary black photography. So that's Ashe next Thursday, and I'll let Shana take it away. Oh my gosh, yes, Steph. I'm so sorry. You know, it's, it's real grassrootsy up here, Steph, come on. <laughs> no, we, we definitely, Loved this film, and we're excited to hear from you, Steph. So, yes. Can y'all hear me okay? okay? I can barely hear myself. I'm very excited to moderate this panel tonight and to see some um, folks I haven't seen in a while and reconnect with. Um, also, I'm excited to be here on the occasion of Patois' 20th year anniversary. So let's give it up for Patois. <laughs> if you haven't purchased or um, signed up to become a member or purchased some of the t-shirts or toes outside, please do so. For those of you who are committed to social justice, we need more, more people speaking Patois, the language spoken at the intersection of art and social justice. Yes. <laughs> um, I want us to talk about the film, and I also want um, the birth workers that are up here to talk about and to share information that the film didn't capture, um, especially as it relates to your own practice. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that there are birth workers and doulas in the room. Um, I want to acknowledge you um, here. Um, so if you're anybody out in the audience as a birth worker or doula, if you could just 
Raise the hand. We want to lift you all up. All right. Nice. Um, so, um, one of the things that really struck me about the film um, was the correlation between integration and um, birthing, specifically as it relates to midwifery, as it relates to what we lost when we think about the medicalization of our bodies and our lives. Um, and at the very beginning, um, one of the women, I believe from Greece, who spoke about um, this 1960s and 70s, as women gained more rights um, and access, we also saw this correlation with um, a, 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 both attack and also less of a belief in the power of midwifery and women being able to take care uh, of both their bodies, but also as it relates to giving birth and how people begin to trust more the medical industry and less so these different traditional ways of taking care of ourselves and each other. Um, the womb knows what to do. The uterus is a very strong muscle. And so I wanna just start there. Uh, if you all can just share, um, if you don't mind starting, um, just some reflections, both as it relates to that correlation, but also as it relates to the work that you're doing. Can you guys hear me? <clears throat> so when I think about birth and I bring my experiences and the experiences of the women in my family that I've heard generationally, it makes me think of the way I came into the world and having conversations with my mother and her mother about how they came into the world. So the process of birth is, and I heard it mentioned in the film and it was so endearing, the process of birth is natural and physiological and spiritual first, right? And then we have these systems in case something goes wrong. So hospitals are not bad, they are there in case there is a problem that goes wrong. But when we oftentimes expand and create systems to catch us when we fall, then that becomes the default. And then you have to follow where the money goes. Who benefits from it? Who profits from people not birthing at home? Who profits from you receiving an intervention? Who profits from you getting Pitocin? Who profits from putting traditional midwives out of business and saying that they are incompetent or that they're kooks or that they don't have the knowledge or that traditional knowledge is not as valuable, if not more valuable than medical institutional knowledge, which borrows and draws from traditional knowledge. So those are my thoughts and reflections um, to get started. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Um, well, what? Look, okay. <laughs> that in the back is um, Effie, who's another midwife and was my preceptor before I got licensed and my current practice partner. So thank you for being here, Effie. Um, uh, yeah, there were a few things that, that came to mind for me when I was thinking about this. And one is just the role that midwives play in protecting and working for bodily autonomy. So much of the work that I've done first as a doula and then as a as a student midwife and then a licensed now licensed midwife has felt like it's been about really fighting for and preserving folks' right to bodily autonomy. I really believe that you know I'm not myself necessarily an advocate of any type of birth for a person. I'm an advocate of someone giving birth in the way that they want to and in the place that they want to and when they want to and surrounded by who they want to be surrounded by. Um, and I think that has become and always been so much of our work as midwives is to really hold on to that for folks, to make sure as much as we can, you know, I think we're really like the keepers of autonomy sometimes in communities from the decision to have or not have a baby all the way through, um, you know, what that looks like for um, care through menopause and, and beyond. Um, and I think that's really, especially now, a really crucial role for us to continue like leaning and stepping into as, as we work. Um, from the film, I thought about my personal experience when it came to birth. I had both of my boys at home. Um, my biggest fear was, when I got pregnant, my biggest fear was, um, even though I had been with my doctor for 
nine years before I was pregnant, um, walking into the hospital and when I walked out of that hospital, being that the statistics were so stacked against me that I feared going into the hospital for any reason. So my, um, my goal was to stay home for as long as possible and just to stay home period. Um, I had the same midwife for both of my boys. Um, she delivered both of them. And um, my family wasn't all that supportive of me having a home birth. And even though I was in school to be a midwife for my first, my mom was not supportive of me doing it at home. She was like, just go to the hospital and do it. And then for my second, she even said, so we're going to the hospital this time. I said, no, I had a successful home birth. Why would I go to the hospital for the next one? And at that point I was a midwife. Um, so I think the film just correlates with how they have so much freedom that I feel and that we're so bound by rules and regulations with having license and being certified. Um, so that's what I kind of got from the, the film. It had all the rules that we have to follow versus how they practice so freely. <laughs> Thank you again for coming, and thank you to Pat Twa for uh, making space for the film. I'm a yoga teacher too, and actually when I started this film, I was just interested in this elder women's wisdom. I had no idea the horrors of childbirth all over the world. How women are, their innate, creative potential is being suppressed by a medical institution. And women would come up and talk to me, they know, know I'm doing the film. And women would come up and talk, talk to me about who have had serious interventions. And they're like, yeah, I had a birth, and I had my baby, and I had the baby, and it's still beautiful to have a child. And then a woman who did it her way would come up, and it would be like night and day. Man, I'll never forget that day the rest of my life. I am like the goddess, you know? And that's how deep it is. It's like a suppression of the primal divine feminine energy and it's under attack. And these are our saviors to help revitalize that, to empower women to have that creative experience that is their right to have. So I've become a, clearly a huge advocate and I hope you join. There's a lot to do. Midwives are significantly underpaid as you've seen in the film. And the policies, there's access denied. This is how doctors suppress them. They don't give them access to hospitals. There's all sorts of stuff. They could talk about it probably better than I can. But get me started. Um, there were so many things in this film that stood out for me, um, both in terms of the various locations, um, um, different ways and modalities and how people support women in giving birth, um, especially a lot of traditional herbs um, and positions, right? Um, I don't want us, I don't want to be remiss if we are talking about midwifery and birthing and not allow for those who are in the audience to have a full understanding of what midwifery is. Audrey, in the film you mentioned uh, midwifery model of care. Um, and also um, thinking about birth work and workers in the broad framework and how midwifery fits under that. So I wanna turn it over to you all to just allow for many of us to be able to enter this conversation by breaking down many of these terms um, and practices um, that are often used and sometimes misused because people just don't know. Y'all don't have to go in a particular order. Um, well, I thought first to clarify, maybe a lot of people know this, but sometimes I hear people use doula and midwife interchangeably. And, you know, we do often work together. Ashley has been a doula. I have also been a doula, though I am now a licensed midwife. Um, but the roles are quite different also. Like doulas provide emotional and informational support and are with folks. Um, midwives generally do kind of um, what we would think of as like the, the medical care, you know, the listening to the heart tones and taking blood pressure and kind of doing the little bit more physical part of like catching the baby and ensuring the safety of the, the parent and baby um, through the prenatal period and um, during the birth and postpartum. And midwives also provide reproductive health care across the, the spectrum of um, someone's reproductive life. So, you know, we also do taps and, you know, well person care and things like that. Um, 
So I do think the midwifery bottle of care is really important to reflect on because I think sometimes it can be really confusing. There's like hospital midwives and home birth midwives and midwives that don't even deliver babies and just do primary care. Um, but a foundation of our approach, um, you know, centers autonomy and partnership um, and is really different than the medical model of care in that way. You know, sometimes when you talk to folks about their experience in the hospital, they'll say, my doctor didn't let me drink or I wasn't, they wouldn't let me go to 41 weeks. You know, we don't do that. We try to have every decision that we engage in with um, a birthing person and their family be a collaborative process of sharing information and working together. Partly because we know that people are experts in their own bodies. People know themselves really, really well. So we might be experts in physiologic birth. We might understand a cervix really well, but we don't know someone else's body. They know their body. And so part of our job is to really listen and work with them to figure out how to make sure that they're able to have the healthcare experience, the life experience, the birth experience that is you know, both safe and dignified and also the one that they want to have. Um, so I think that those are some really, you know, key aspects of a midwifery model of care. Um, you know, I think we also really believe in access and we believe that everybody should have access to the birth that they want to have, that it shouldn't be dependent on health insurance or a payment um, model or something like that. Just to kind of piggyback off what she said, um, our care is more personal. Um, our prenatal visits and postpartum visits are longer. Um, sometimes we're seeing them up to an hour long in their prenatal care. Um, we do a lot of educating. We talk about nutrition. So the visits are just 10, 15 minutes and then you're in and out. Um, and then as far as postpartum, we're going to them the very next day after they have their baby. So our postpartum care starts at day one and then day three and one week and two weeks and six weeks. So it's not just the, hey, you have your baby and then we see you six months later. Um, as far as you were talking about traditional and um, CPMs, CPM, yeah. so CPMs are certified professional midwives. Um, most CPMs can practice at, in home birth setting or um, in a birth center and not in a hospital. Um, a CNM is, is a certified nurse midwife. She has become a nurse before she became a midwife. Um, and they can practice in a birth center or um, in a hospital setting. I have three children, ages one through 19, and my births have looked vastly different. Um, my first birth was a hospital birth, and my last two births, which were closer together, um, were home births. Audrey and Effie, who's in the back, were my midwives for my two-year-old, um, for my second child. And I remember in my third trimester, taking a walk with my dog and the leash became tangled between my leg. For all of you dog people, I'm sure this has never happened to you. Um, and I fell down on the concrete in my third trimester. I was terrified. I fell on my face. I started crying. I, you know, my knee was bleeding and I didn't know if my baby was okay or not. So I immediately, my neighbor helped me. I did not immediately get up. My neighbor came over to help me get up and proceeded to tell me that this wasn't as bad as the time he was stabbed. Um, <laughs> um, but helped me get up nonetheless, brought me inside, and um, I texted my midwives immediately, um, hey, I just fell, I'm thinking the worst, I don't know what happened. You were to my house in maybe 30 minutes or less and checked my vitals, listened to my baby's heartbeat, made sure that I felt comfortable and okay, made me a cup of tea, bandaged my knee, um, and sat with me until I felt comfortable. So just listen, not just listening to the heartbeat one time and saying, oh, okay, you're fine, your baby's fine, go ahead. Like, would you like us to listen to it for a period of two hours and sat there with me? in my home until I felt 100% secure. That's one story. That's my personal story and I've also supported lots of people who have been supported by midwives. I did not have to get up and go and sit in a waiting room. I didn't have to see someone that I didn't know, but that's care, right? 
that's the type of care that I was provided through the home birth midwifery model, which is what worked for me. My sister-in-law would have immediately wanted to go to the hospital and see what was going on, and that's her level of comfort. So it's like Audrey mentioned, it's not about you should have you should do this because that's what I did. It's that I was able to do what made me feel most comfortable in that moment, and you should be able to do what makes you feel most comfortable. We should have options to birth as we choose. I do have some okay. more questions. <laughs> oh, Ashley, do you want to say anything as related to, um, you know, doulas in the context of midwifery and also as birth workers in terms of that support? Yeah, so I've probably been explaining the difference between a doula and a midwife to my immediate family for the past 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, sort of folks also understand what <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Absolutely. So a doula is a person that is with a pregnant person, right? A doula, the name doula means servant, a person that is there to serve and to help you during that process. So way before any of us were born, it looked like boiling water. It looked like being at your bedside. It looked like rubbing your back. It looked like massaging your feet. When I first got into birth work in a, over a decade ago, what it looked like for me was I would go to, I worked with teen parents and I would go to high schools and I would talk to them about their experiences and allow them to have space where they did not feel they were shamed. Um, we would burn lavender and um, use hand oils to massage each other's hands and have herbal tea and sit down and have conversations. And that is a part of birth, right? That's a part of the process of being a doula. That's a part of creating safe spaces for people is a part of that process. And when you're a black doula, and when you're a black person who's giving birth, and when you're a person who existed, exists and lives in the margins, then that's not all of it. It should be, right? It should be all flowers and roses and essential oils <laughs> and massages. And that is a huge part of it. But my work became advocacy undoubtedly because my clients were unable to let me stop i was unable to use my voice during my first birth my first birth was as a young person it was as a teenager and i wanted all of the drugs right i wanted all of the meds i wanted the epidurals and i wanted that because that was all i heard and knew of my physician who was very unkind to me because I was a young person giving birth, decided that they would not give me an epidural because I needed to feel it, because I needed to be punished, because you got into this situation, this, this is what you get, this is what birth is like. And while that was not their choice, I thanked them. That shifted to me that I never wanted anyone to have to go through a, a scenario where in their most vulnerable state. And one of the most vulnerable moments of their lives where someone would decide that they wanted to punish them um, for the choices that they were deciding to make. So that's what sparked my work with, with working with people as a doula. And doulas are just with people. We, we're, we're container holders, we're space holders, right? We keep secrets and we keep family members who get on your nerves but you love at bay. We hold your hand, we do research, we tell you what resources to have in your community, who to connect with. We talk to you about what your needs are. We talk to you about how you came into this world. We talk to you about what your vision is for your birth and for your baby and allow you to have space to celebrate or whine and bitch. And that's what doulas do. Um. Your story reminds me of, of a client that we had here in New Orleans, which I feel like really illustrated kind of some of, of the work that we do in practicing in this specific environment. I'm sure many of you have, have read the, the news and seen the, the data that's out about perinatal mortality, and it's really terrible. And you know, it, it got a lot worse in 2021. 20, uh, um, and I often like, you know, as a midwife, I think it, it is really critical that we look at those numbers and think about them and work hard to improve them. I mean, you know, we um, have a 
uh, maternal mortality rate that's like 32.9 per 100,000. I mean, it's does many, many times um, uh, more than, than most other countries with our kind of resources. And, but I also think that's just like the worst and most terrible bar ever. Like this should be a time of joy and celebration. Birth should be a ceremony, it should be sacred, and it should be a time when people are able to experience you know, dignity and joy and comfort. Um, it's also something that most people will only do one or two or three or four times in their life. Like, so it should be one of the most special moments of their life in their, in their family's life. And it, you know, I think it's really painful that for many people staying alive is their focus. You know, that's just not an acceptable bar. It should not be an acceptable bar. We should be thinking about how we center joy and dignity and sacredness in that process. Um, and it always makes me think of a person who came to us and she, you know, had, um, I think, in the eyes of the medical establishment, kind of beat the odds. She was like a larger body person um, without many financial resources. And she had had three births that were fine by, you know, they were full term, they were, um, you know, healthy babies she didn't have any hypertension or rehospitalizations or anything so i think you know in the eyes of her providers they were like this is a success story but she felt really minimized and ignored in her process and like it was violent and damaging to her she also got induced against her wishes and was not able was told she couldn't breastfeed which she really wanted to do so she came to us i think for her fourth baby and had um a fabulous natural birth in a tub in her living room um, and uh, you know successfully initiated breastfeeding and and went on to, to breastfeed that baby for for a number of months maybe a year or more and she really felt like this was like a you know she has several daughters so she felt like they were there at the birth and she felt like it was really like a multi-generational healing process for us when she went to have her next baby um, she was in, had moved and she drove back from another city and had that baby here. And, you know, I think for her, it really felt like this was a lifelong process of reclaiming her dignity um, and, you know, joy at being a parent and um, at kind of reclaiming her sense of power in her, in her own experience. Um, and I think, you know, that is something that everyone should have when they have a baby. You know, that should be what everyone is able to experience, even if they give birth in a hospital or, in an OR, wherever they are, that should be, you know, kind of how the process goes. The United States, it's a little bit on our promotion. It's like one of the most dangerous places to have a birth. One of the developed countries that is the most dangerous place to have a birth. This is the statistic she's talking about. And that is 95% of the births are in hospital. So just to clarify, they're not with midwives. And then there's lots of policy barriers preventing midwifery, like it's legal to have a home birth, but it's illegal to have a midwife at the home birth. So there's just some crazy stuff out there. And then there's different degrees, like traditional midwife, it's really shunned. Certified professional midwives, you know, in half the states, it's like a legal. And then um, the nurse, a certified nurse midwife is tricky. There's some certified professional midwives feel like they're just an extension of the hospital. But Haley in here is really open-minded and she was a CNM and she's really trying to bridge the gap. And that's the goal, is bridging the gap between traditional wisdom and modern technology across many fields. You know, but reproductive health is where it starts. And just one second. And so, um, I don't know what rushing me, but, um, so, we have to talk about the film next, so. Okay. You're good. Okay, let me finish. So, as again, the yoga background, <coughs> existence, like our first chakra foundation, how we come into this world is so important. They actually look at child development from three on, and I'm inviting researchers, hey, start about birth. Look at the development of children from their birth experience and how has that affected their development? And so there's lots to uncover here and there's lots of opportunities with these organizations and various stuff with the film that we'll talk about later. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I know, but yes. it's based. So we all recognize that giving birth in the United States, and just want to f specifically focus on the U.S., um, is people get birth in violent, um, very violent situations um, and under violent circumstances. We also, one of the things that came out in the film that I really appreciate, and I'm glad you included, um, it wasn't edited out. Um, Latanya, Latanya is stating in the film critiquing um, a lot of traditional knowledge and ways of existing and being in the world that is often has to be um, legitimized by evidence base or scientific evidence base. And we also recognize science have not always been kind to many of the communities that have been featured in the film. And we don't also need science to legitimize or justify, right? Oh, now it's okay because science have proven it. When whether we could say midwives, women have been birthing for millennia, right? And so, and also how a pregnant body is seen as a damage or a body that's broken and needs to be fixed, like it's a medical problem, right? And so I wanna shift the conversation a bit to allow you all and for you to engage in conversation about reflections on the film, um, what was shared, um, what came up for you, uh, what would you like to add and also what inspired you to produce this film. And then I'm gonna to shift to the audience to invite questions, but I want us to give some time as birth workers to reflect and, and all the things that came up. So much stuff came up for me, but I just wanna turn it over to you all. Um, I think something that stood out for me, I think it was in Brazil, how they were confined to their homes for six months. The, uh, the babies stay home for six months and I think that that could never happen here. We're so forced and rushed to go back to work within six weeks. And um, sometimes I've had clients who've been in Target a week later. Um, so I, that really stood out to me, the um, being confined to their home and having ceremonies after. And then you were talking about the evidence-based care um, and that science finally recognized it, even though it's things that have been going on for years and years and years and things that are normally in standard in our practice um one thing was the delayed cord clamping that's just something that we automatically do um and now that science has recognized it it's becoming um more mainstream mm -hmm. um yeah i think it was the six month staying home for six months that really stood out to me Um, I, there were a couple things, you know, I think one was the way that, that a lot of the midwives did talk about sort of people moving away from giving birth in their, in their communities. Um, and I think as a midwife, I've really struggled with what Latona talked about there, where it's like, you know, you want a seat at the table because we want to increase people's access to this kind of care. Um, certainly, you know, Medicaid um, reimbursement or payment is problematic, but it also, in states where it works, it really means that much larger numbers of folks can receive midwifery care and receive care in the midwifery model. So I, I, I felt, I feel that tension. Um, I serve on our state perinatal quality commission as a, as a faculty member. I'm the only midwife um, currently um, serving as a faculty member. And you know, so it's like me and all of these doctors and nurses. But I also feel like it's really critical to be in those spaces because that is where thousands and thousands of people have their, their babies. Um, and so, you know, I feel like it's important to be having those conversations. Um, but I also do feel that loss of like autonomy and freedom that that comes with that. And I, you know, I felt that from those midwives and I, I went to school, uh, midwifery school in Maine and it has been through many rounds of contentious licensing and reimbursement um, process to figure out, you know, what the rules are and what the reimbursement is. Um, and, you know, I just feel like we're always kind of holding that tension of wanting to, to be autonomous and wanting to practice in the way um, that is respectful of people and respectful of our traditions and also to, to figure out how to increase our access um, and, you know, be a part of like a larger movement.
One of the things that stood out to me in the film, and Steph, I don't know if it was your intention, but around many of the traditional practices, um, words would come up and it would cite um, <clears throat> research that had been done to, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Um, in the film, I was saying, I don't know if it was intentional, but around the traditional practices, we would get these words on the screen that would then cite research. And I wondered in how many of our minds did that mean, ah, okay, now I understand, or now it's valid, as opposed to, what do you mean they're blowing in baby's ears? Or what do you mean they're giving them an egg? But it's like, okay, if I can give you a scientific definition, then it's valid. And I think that's how many times people who do traditional work people who exist in communities who tell their lived experiences and their stories, but if it doesn't fit within a specific proximity to academia, or if it doesn't fit in a specific proximity to whiteness, then it's not valid until someone validates it, who you trust and believe that has, that has particular letters behind their name or who has read a bunch of books about the people of lived experience. So um, that was something that um, was very illuminated for me in the film. And as I did lots of work around Medicaid reimbursement policies and had to interface oftentimes with people from Medicaid and with physicians and providing continuing educations to them, oftentimes people would want to read every document and they would do everything except be kind to people except lead with empathy, except listen, except, except check your privilege and put it back. And that's across race and ethnicity. So you can't always find everything in the research. Sometimes you have to listen to people. Um, well, the, the goal was to bridge the gap. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and what was um, often in, documentary styles you'll follow a character or they'll try to interweave characters and because of the cultures and the topics I felt it's so important just to go from culture to culture and it's not a traditional documentary edited piece and that was done to try to respect the cultures and to take you in to their invitation because it was their imitation to share what they chose to share. So that's just something a little different. But in the coming with the science or the evidence base, and that comes from Gudgie, who's a Mohawk, is she starts out, and, and what's really embedded in this is the language, the language of birth. And I've had a few screenings, and midwives have come, and how we define normal is in the pre-question, right? So an OB, uh, bir breach birth, cross-section. For an OB, high risk, C-section, you're on your way probably. For midwives up in Washington State, that's just another normal. That's just another normal birth. What's the stress level and just what I just said? High risk, normal. Like there's a whole language that we bought into that's just wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. And it's fear driven to monetize. So this is um, hoping, we're hoping to do an educational tour and to engage women before they're in their reproductive, um, you know, starting to think about the family structure and stuff like that, to just open the minds for the options and maybe hopefully some of them will join the cause to become a midwife or a doula or reach out and, and um, start advocating and start pushing for a more sustainable and fair um, pricing through insurance. It's a no-brainer for insurance. A C-section, 50000 and up. Have you ever seen $50,000 or $1 in which client? <laughs> Hello? I've never seen 50,000 anything. So, um, you know, come on, this is like better for our economy. You know, it's just so obvious. But anyway, is that- a, Can I make one thing to say, um, uh, 
I just appreciated what you said, Ashley, about listening to people. I, I just think that is like such a crucial piece of what we do as midwives, and it does come through in, in this film that you know the life saving uh, potential of listening to people is just huge. I remember being on this call for the mortality review something, and this insurance person kept saying, well, you know, our deaths were failure to rescue and failure to rescue. And finally, I'm like, I think what you're saying is you did not listen to people. People told you that they were ill, that they were dying, and you just did not help them. Um, and you know, I think that that just happens over and over and over in our systems. Um, and I think it is like this, you know, really critical piece of midwifery care and in what doulas do, right? We just listen to people and believe them when they tell us things about themselves and their bodies. And I think that's just so really critical, <laughs> right? <laughs> and simple. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to like kind of amplify that. Yeah, okay. So I have a couple of announcements to make and I also want to create space for some questions. Um, it's nine o'clock. Um, there's the, it's the climate justice. The climate justice series have started at the broad side. Um, so if those who was planning to go, like this is your moment. Um, but for those who want to stay for some questions and also for a big announcement about tomorrow's program, just hang tight. Um, questions for our guests. Yes. You. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Sierra, and I'm a student of Life at Anaheim. And I was wondering if you guys could speak about creating more access for people who want to get into this work. Especially, like, the film kind of referenced a desert of accessibility for midwives. So people who are interested in doing more traditional midwifery work, creating space to find place afterwards or to be trained as doulas or to kind of do this work, where could they direct it? where they're actually OBs and uh, traditional midwives are coming together and doing information exchange. So if you Google Guatemala, there is some stuff um, there. Just trying to start researching out. And then there's local, like there's uh, Nicole Sister Diggins. Um, sister midwife, she does trainings. And uh, I'm sure she can point you in certain directions. And there's this wonderful magazine out of Eugene, Oregon uh, midwifery today and then uh, we touched upon indigenous a lot of indigenous cultures and I invite you all to join Amazon watch which they are fighting for the Amazon indigenous rights mining and you uh, maybe once a week you might get an interesting email of what they're doing for the benefit of all of us in the earth so um, I just want to plug all the, that and while I'm at it, I have my handy bag here for our virtual screening from 4, uh, May 4th to 11 with our QR code. You can grab a couple, give it to your, some, some of your friends. We'll be doing an online screening and there'll be discussion on the 9th and stuff like that to keep sharing and getting this information out. And we're looking for sponsors and the film's been accepted to be on PBS. Um, we're, we're pushing back the air date. And we're looking for underwriters, which means that this film will be brought to you by you. And you get recognition to a large audience base, but it helps us cover some of the costs in getting the film broadcast ready. So I have personal cards, they're really pretty, that have my phone number and email, and I'd be glad to give anybody that's interested with contacts to uh, resources to help us get this film to the next level. Okay, we want to make sure I got that in before yeah, everybody left. Yeah, yeah, I want to make mm -hmm. sure the folks here also have an opportunity to share other local resources and how people can connect. Because one of the things that stood out for me, one of the other things that also stood out for me for the film uh, was, wow, should I be having more kids or should I be um, becoming engaged my, in more in birth work? And so. If you all can speak to some of the resources here, or connections, that would be great. To answer your question too, um, you can look at um, Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners and search midwives, and it'll give you a list of every active midwife and if you are looking for a preceptor. Um, also, we, I think we both went to schools that are now closed, so it, I think it is really hard. Um, I would love to you know, kind of amplify and lift up 
Earth Park Doula Collective, which both Ashley and I have worked for over the years and I think is, has been a real anchor of birth justice work in our city. Um, uh, also, there is in Florida now, Je Jenny Joseph's Common Sense Childbirth has an accredited, NIC accredited midwifery school that I think had it been open when I went to midwifery school, I definitely would have gone there. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I think that's, a, I'm really thankful that that option exists now for folks. And I think there is some pretty significant fundraising to try and make it more accessible to, to folks um, financially. Um, I felt very lucky to precept with Effie who paid me for some of my time as a student. And, you know, I think continuing to like kind of push and organize to make sure that preceptorship experiences are equitable and manageable for folks is really crucial. Because it is, you know, it's three years of your life that's hard for people if you don't, you know, if you need to be working and all that. Any more questions? Yes. I believe the question, and correct me if I'm leaving anything out, the question was how does midwifery, and I'm gonna also put in doula work, birth work in general, what, what can it teach us in other areas of our life? So I'm very excited that you asked that question. There's so many things that can te teach you. I advise everyone to take a doula training, and I think it doesn't just start with people who are certified or people who have this specific thing. It's about having conversations at your kitchen table, at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, in the beauty shop, at, I don't wanna say at work, but like, um, but having those conversations in your insular communities where people will listen and respect you. So it's about dismantling systemic racism, having conversations, if you have a knowledge, if you have knowledge, if you have information, not holding on to that or not, not saying anything, and I'm going to say this because it's very important, and I have some amazing friends who just so happen to be white, and oftentimes won't say anything because they don't wanna say anything wrong. Say it. Those who stand in the face of, who are silent in the face of oppression have taken the side of the oppressor. So it's very important to engage in those difficult conversations, not out in the streets, but just like with your friends and family. That's really important. Another thing that birth work has really taught me is the power of listening and the power of communication. So when I say listening, like actively listening, like not necessarily having to insert my own story or my own experiences, but sitting back. As doulas, we were taught not to talk about our birth stories in that space. And that was something we did for a very long time. I've done it when it's appropriate, but I don't want one of my clients or someone I'm supporting to compare themselves to my experience because we're different. And it's not about what my experience was like or what I wanted, but it's about what you want and you really holding that space in that container. And in terms of communicating, I think it just teaches you how to beautifully ask questions, how to, um, pay attention to the things that are not said, not just the things that are said, and really be in tune and tap into your empathy when navigating life situations, not only when a person is preparing to give birth, but also in your personal relationships. Do y'all wanna add anything before I do my plug? No, that's it. Thank you so much. So one thing, just to piggyback on that and thinking about the power of listening um, and being responsive to what you're hearing, the same is true for the series that we're going to launch tomorrow here at the Broad um, at 6.30 p.m. We're going to feature a sort of series of shorts as well as the film Angola, Do You Hear Us? Light Patois, marking our 28 years, activist, um, I would say revolutionary, power broker Norris Henderson will be celebrating his 28 year release from Angola. So he's gonna open a film tomorrow, um, with a, do a beautiful opening. So we strongly encourage you all to come out uh, for that program tomorrow, 6.30 here at the Broad. Um, did I leave anything out related to that program? Um, thank you all for staying with us and also um, supporting, learning and listening about doula work. I feel like there's the power of listening. The film also showed us the power of touch, how midwives are not afraid and with respect to touch people. Um, and so I think that midwifery and doula birth work can also allow us to hear and also how we can hear through touch. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all for coming out.